Welcome everybody. I'm Matt Johnson, Counsel for the New Hampshire Association of Realtors. I'm thrilled today to have with me Lee Brown. We've just completed our uh, professional standards workshop today in Manchester. Uh, the topic today was professionalism professionalism as a business tactic. Uh, Lee Brown uh, has a long time NAR realtor. Uh, she's been an instructor. She does a National Code of Ethics Day where it's a fundraiser for a uh, the Realtor Relief Fund. Uh, she's the 2023 president of the North Carolina Realtors, also a prolific author. She has three books, including uh, the most recent one you see in front of us, The Seven Deadly Sins of Sales. Lee, thank you for taking some time after talking to us today about professionalism. I wanted to touch on a couple points that I found really compelling uh, that you talked about, one of which is you, you had a great tip about having a form for acknowledging receipt of the offers. That's a constant complaint we have in our marketplace. Can you explain how you came up with that and how it helps your practice? Well, thank you, Matt. It, I think every good practice in real estate comes out of your own frustrations. And the last three years of this insane COVID era market has just driven us all crazy. And I feel for a listing agent who gets 45 offers on a listing and can barely keep them organized. And then agents don't tell you an offer's coming and it goes to spam and you're trying desperately to get organized. And then your sellers look at everything and you're trying to figure out how to advise them on selecting an offer. In all of that hubbub, a listing agent can forget to alert the buyer agents, A, that the offer was received, and then B, that it was presented. So I'll, I'll start this by saying I don't think it's necessarily malicious behavior on the behalf of the, behalf of the listing agent. I think it's just the emotion and the stress and the time pressure that gets to a lot of people. The other thing I'll say is that the buyer agents need to do a better job of alerting a listing agent that an offer is coming. So phone call, hey, offer's on the way, a text, please check your email, see, did you check your email? And then we realize there's a gap because some listing agents don't acknowledge the receipt, even when they got it, and then don't acknowledge presenting the offer when they did. So we initiated a form in our office that goes along with every received offer that says we received it, seller reviewed it, and then we have a little checkbox that they either countered it and the counter is attached or that they are declining it and then it's signed by the seller and it's dated and time stamped. And that way the buyer's agent knows what the outcome is. We have found that's the only fair way to handle this because there's so many hurt feelings when the buyer comes out of the same office as the listing agent and there may be a an agreement for a undisclosed or disclosed, there could be fee arrangements, there's all these other intricacies that are going on. We as professionals have to do a better job of taking care of our other professionals and that to me is transparency. So if there is a variable fee agreement, that's been disclosed in the multiple. And the presentation of the offer was added in there and they've been alerted to it. And just so you know, because some of you might not have read the changes to the Code of Ethics, there was an update to the Code of Ethics in January of 2022 that involves written confirmation of these counteroffers and presentations. So just do a better job. And for me as a broker, doing a better job means making it easy for my agents. So it's a very simple form that was prepared by my attorney. So if you're just a regular person like I am, I can't engage in the unauthorized practice of law by making it for myself. So I had my, lo my local attorney create this form. We add it. My agents now can give comfort to other agents. They can give comfort to their clients when they lose that at least they were heard. I mean, honestly, a lot of our complaints, Matt, come from gaps in communication. Absolutely. And people can deal with losing if they know they at least had a fair shot. And that's what this boils down to is letting the public know they had a fair shot. So the other risk management tip that I thought was fascinating and I'm going to steal and use in my presentations is yeah, the concept of keeping a notebook so that you keep, keep you take contemporaneous notes when you've had phone calls or conversations with other agents. I can say as the attorney who defends agents uh, when claims are made, uh, the, the, to be able to have a source of contemporaneous notes is going to go a really long way to often make the claim go away immediately and if not, put yourself in a good position. So 
uh, tell the audience a little bit of how you came up with that idea and how long you've done it. So, no offense, but I'm allergic to attorneys. And so, <laughs> to sit this close to you and I don't have a rash, I feel pretty comfortable, but I don't want to have my name called out by an attorney. I don't want a letter from the commission. But in real estate, you are inherently in a risky profession because there's so much emotion involved, there's so much money involved. And frankly, a lot of our rules and laws can be subjective because we're dealing with humans on the seller side and humans on the buyer side and then speed kicks in and again I've got to reference the last three years the COVID market I think has exposed for a lot of us our business practices that need to be strengthened not that people were doing things poorly but when market conditions change you have to take what you're doing well and make it better so that you can protect your business protect your brokerage not make any E&O claims. I mean, that changes your premium. So there's all these reasons to get better. And in the COVID pressure cooker, you'd have a showing at three o'clock with a deadline for offers at five o'clock. And so the time clock is enormously ticking. And you're the buyer's agent, so you're calling the listing agent. Hey, are the disclosures in MLS? Hey, I got the, hey, I'm sending you this offer. And I, I sent it by this time. And here's the email I sent it to. And we do a lot of stuff by telephone and we do a lot by text as well, but we also know that when agents don't get a text reply, they resort to the telephone. And I'm just going to say the telephone should be your first, not your last resort. Just going to add that in. And so they're trying to make sure that they are doing everything within a time frame. In my office, I started this a long time ago. I keep a call log and the call log is essentially this. So today is February 23rd and it is currently 1.15 recording this. I would make down a note that I talked to David at 1.15 and requested disclosures, requested the email at 1.30, sent the offer over at 1.35, confirmed by telephone, text, email. Keep a note of all the phone calls that you're making or even your tasks during the day. And where it really gets heated is let's just say 3 o'clock is the offer deadline and you get a call from the listing agent and he says, hey, the sellers kind of like your offer best, but they want to know if your buyer can go up 20 grand. And you say, let me call you right back. You call your client, you're like, look, they're talking to me. Can you go up 20 grand? Buyer says yes. You call the listing agent, give me two minutes to do paperwork. Then you call your client, say, get on your email, here's the paperwork. And you're hustling. So you're doing it by telephone. And then you're following up with paperwork. But in the world of legal people like Matt, they're going to see that gap of time. And if you do get called in front of the commission, they say, well, what, why did this happen like this? Because the buyer says, nobody told me I was trying to win them out and nobody told me 20 grand. It could have been 10. It becomes he said, she said, if you've got this call log that says, no, nah, dude, I got the call here. Here's what was said. I made a phone call. I responded here. Keep a record of the phone so that the in writing stuff has another thing to bridge that gap. So I have books of little journals and call logs going back years of calls made, calls received, conversations had. And I can't stress this enough, the stickiest part is that counteroffer time frame because we're often working it out with the other agent verbally before you reduce it to writing. And we know that code of ethics and state law say that it's got to be in writing to be enforceable. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get dragged to a code of ethics hearing or an arbitration hearing or a commission hearing. And it might have to be in writing to be enforceable, but you could still go down with the ship. So we're all about keeping everything reduced to writing. And what I've always looked at it as, I know my fellow realtors are amazing humans, but they're not always the most organized people on the planet. I'm probably the only one keeping the call logs. And so if I do wind up in a place where somebody's he said and she said and with me, and I've got this record, right or wrong, I, I know what I've been saying all these years, and I can show how I operate my business. I have to believe that gives me some protection, but I haven't tested the theory out, don't want to <coughs> test the theory out. If so you this have is it, all you may never need it. Preventative maintenance yes, is what absolutely. this is. I don't want deferred maintenance, I yeah. want preventative. Absolutely. All right, so my last question for you, this is professional standards, and I thought one of the most compelling points you made, or I'll combine two points, in the presentation today where, where first, uh, this is a self-enforcing system, so realtors have to be not afraid to bring ethics complaints and enforce the rules. And second, uh, your compelling point was step up and volunteer for professional standards and grievance. And I thought those were very powerful. So if you could just explain a little bit to our audience uh, why those two concepts are so important. Well, it's interesting to me that we 
often delineate the difference in a realtor and a licensee as being the adherence to the code of ethics. We mostly love the code of ethics as realtor members, and then we don't enforce it because our people in general won't everybody get along. We don't like confrontation. We're a little bit passive aggressive, and we don't want to turn somebody else in because they didn't mean to, or they're really nice, or most importantly, most realtors don't turn in the offending party because they're afraid of retaliation in the future. And so my question becomes, how seriously do we take this license that we have where our state governing body gave us the public trust? And if we are serious about protecting the public, then if somebody is misbehaving per the code of ethics that they said they would adhere to, so remember that, the other members said they would adhere to it, if they've screwed up, it's either because they were ignorant to the rules or because they were malicious. If they were ignorant and you turn them in, most of the time people will turn the corner and say, I had no idea I was breaking a rule, I'm not doing it again, I want to be the good guy here, and they will become better realtors. The other side that's malicious, why would you leave the malicious ones out there in the public to hurt your neighbors? I mean, I will tell you one thing my dad said, my dad's a retired realtor, he always said that if the people around you don't know there's a good option, with whom could they get stuck? Because we know there's good and bad members in every marketplace. And his point was that they're out there. We have to A, let the public know that they deserve the best possible option, and that B, we have to hold that member to account. So you can't be afraid of retaliation because otherwise you're saying, let's just let the snake operate in the market. and so be it if they hurt the public because I would like to bring my buyer to the house they're representing so my buyer can get tangled with the snake. Now hang on a minute, that math doesn't add up. We really just have to be thoughtful about it. Now I don't advocate for frivolous behavior that we turn people in because we don't like them. You should know the code of ethics. Every member should read the code of ethics and say, you know what, this seems to be a clear violation. I will say that many times I've called a member in my market and asked them to correct behavior so I don't have to turn them in. And a lot of people have. And so there's a lot to be said for that grace we can show each other because they may not know about the rule changes, especially with changes to the code, which have happened November of 2020. We had more changes in 21, more in 22. There'll be more coming. That's an opportunity for growth. But if somebody's not going to listen or argues with me, I am going to turn them in because it's the public perception of who realtors are that has to matter to us. And their protection has to matter enough that we want them to have a better realtor. The second half of what you asked me has to do with volunteering and we go through a lot of case studies in my professional standards class because I love the real life scenarios and what it means to the people we serve and what it means to our trade organization. And there was a case study that most of the room didn't agree with the outcome. They didn't like what that panel said and all I can say is that we're not a perfect society. We're not perfect people. Thank heavens we don't have to be. But in real estate, we are organized so that when a complaint is made, it is heard by a panel of peers. And if you don't like decisions that are made, then you've got to be in the room. You've got to be willing to invest your time and energy in your fellows. And if you don't like what the other panel said, then be the one that raises your hand and says, I'm willing to be in the room to help be a voice for the other side of the argument. Because there's always more than two sides to a story. And when you raise your hand, you're bringing in your experience, your background, your viewpoint on professionalism and real estate to the table. You might be the viewpoint the rest of us need to take the organization forward. And if you never raise your hand and come in the room and be the one that's willing to help us change the perception of professionalism, well, you're just keeping us all back. We need you. And it doesn't matter what your background is. You don't have to be an attorney by trade. Before real estate, I sold chainsaws and worked on Wall Street. So my background has very little to do with the practice of real estate. But when you combine that with somebody who was a stay-at-home parent, somebody else who was a consultant, and somebody else that sold building supplies, you bring all those perspectives into a room and we start to see an opportunity to make ourselves better. So if you think you don't have time to volunteer, you do, you just may have to shuffle your schedule a little bit and stop staring at Facebook so much. And maybe you'll find that if you invest an hour a month in your real estate trade organization, your transactions will go smoother because getting to know your volunteers can change how you feel about real estate and your fellow realtors. 
and then you start to be that voice in the room and grievance and professional standards that's willing to challenge each of us to get better and hold us to a better standard which changes everything forever so don't sit on the sidelines anymore and if you're going to sit on the sidelines then you can't complain so that's the rule if you want to complain show up Lee fantastic advice fantastic uh, presentation today uh, and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future and thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today thank you I was wondering what you picked out of the class and we missed you here today please make sure that you show up when the association puts on events because I promise you they are doing things that are out to make all of us better.